Diabetes is one of the biggest health problems facing the world today, and by 2040, it's estimated that one in five Americans will be diabetic. It's estimated that half a million Americans will die every year and cost the US half a trillion dollars in health care expenditures. Now, diabetes is horrible and is more or less caused by high blood sugar. When you have high blood sugar, it affects the lining of your blood vessels, makes them leaky, thickens them, makes it difficult for them to deliver nutrients and oxygen. And this can affect your tissues and this can affect your nerves. It can cause symptoms like strokes. It can cause kidney failure, dialysis. It can cause neuropathy or damage to your nerves. And some people have to have their foot amputated. It can cause loss of vision. All these horrible, horrible symptoms due to high blood sugar. Now, what causes blood sugar to be high in the first place? What causes diabetes? The main hormone that lowers and controls our blood sugar is going to be insulin. Insulin is produced by our pancreas, this abdominal organ. And it produces it and it takes in blood sugar, puts it in our cells, instead of letting it float around in our blood and creating havoc. So insulin is incredibly important. And some people don't produce enough insulin. Some people have a autoimmune disorder that destroys their pancreas and makes it difficult to produce insulin. We call that type one diabetes. But lately and globally, type two diabetes is becoming more common and more prevalent. Type two diabetes is associated with obesity, sedentary lifestyle, a poor diet. And people generally produce enough insulin. It just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, many prevailing theories and a lot of research still going on, but one theory is that when you exercise and you exercise a lot, you'll take in sugar, insulin will work, everything will be fine and dandy, and you'll use that sugar because you need to use that sugar. But the opposite is true. If you don't exercise, if you live a sedentary lifestyle, then your cells won't take in sugar because it doesn't need to. Insulin doesn't work because it doesn't need to. And if you live a sedentary lifestyle, if you eat high caloric, high sugar foods, and you're not using it, and it builds up in your blood, you get diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes is very common, but historically, type 1 diabetes was the main player. And type 1 diabetes was more or less a death sentence. You didn't produce enough insulin, well, there's nothing we could do. We couldn't isolate and give you insulin. We didn't have that capabilities. Until two scientists came along and changed the whole game. Inner Frederick Banting and Inner John McLeod. Let's talk about Banting first. Banting was a Canadian doctor born in 1891. Now he loved art and he would go to the University of Toronto to study art, but he would actually fail out and become a doctor instead. I'm sure his parents weren't too upset about that. And so he would, in, in addition to his clinical studies, in addition to his clinical work, he would also give lectures to the University of Toronto. And one day he was going to give a lecture on the pancreas. So he was reading scientific reports and literature on the pancreas just as a refresher. And one report caught his eye. It described diabetes and hypothesized that a hormone called insulin was important in diabetes and that it was missing. And if you could replace and give this hormone, give insulin, it could cure diabetes. And that was his light bulb moment. He said, why don't I just isolate insulin and give it insulin? Yay! Problem is, many people had already tried that and they failed. They tried to mulch up pancreatic cells and kind of extract insulin. That didn't work. They tried to give people pancreatic extracts, hopefully hoping that that would produce insulin. That didn't work. It was very difficult to extract insulin. It was very difficult to isolate insulin. If you disrupted any cells around insulin, it would produce a bunch of enzymes that just degraded and destroyed insulin. So it was very difficult to work with, very finicky. But he didn't want to give up. He was optimistic. He would read a report in 1920 about a Russian doctor, Moses Barone who wrote about a very strange case. In this case, a little stone was found in the pancreas that blocked the pancreatic duct. And when it blocked the pancreatic duct, then the cells that produce insulin stayed intact. But the cells around it that produce enzymes that could break down insulin started to deteriorate and die. And that doctor later described that if you tie the pancreatic duct, you can have the same effect. Banting thought, could this be the key to finally extracting insulin? So he approached a colleague of his, John McLeod, with the idea. Now, John McLeod was a seasoned researcher, and he thought Banting was crazy. He said, listen, you don't really know what you're talking about. You're just reading papers. You're just reading articles. A lot of very smart scientists have already tried to extract insulin and have failed. What makes you different? Banting would say his lack of experience was actually a plus. He said it made him optimistic, it made him not jaded, it made him want to continue further. He would actually convince McLeod to lend him facilities, lend him students, lend him all this equipment to do this research. And they partnered together and would work on this technique and finally they were successful in isolating insulin. Now those two didn't get along all the time, they bickered a lot. And after isolating insulin, they tried a human trial. 
and it failed. And tensions escalated, but fortunately they stayed together and after a while they were successful in their first human trial of insulin on a 14 year old type one diabetic. That changed the game. Now insulin is made in a much different way, but this was the first steps in producing insulin. And Banting would sell his patent for a dollar saying he didn't want anyone uh, to profit from insulin and profit from drugs that are just important. So I'm very glad he's not allowed to see this bullcrap going on right now. Unfortunately, Banting would die at an early age from a plane crash, but for his work and McLeod's work in isolating and developing insulin, they would win the Nobel Prize in 1923. Now before I go, I always like to ask an interesting question if I can. And I asked the question before, should there be a limit in drug prices? And one of the arguments for not having a limit is that they have to recoup R&D prices and, and development prices. But recently there's been a rise in prices. And my question is, should historical drugs that have been cheap for very long be price protected in the future no matter what? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, hit like. If you wanna see more of this series, hit subscribe and click somewhere here for other videos in this series. Thanks.